Good morning. It's a bit of a weird situation, I feel, because the church is very quite, quite full, and but all our kids are away and traveling. So that's that's really weird. I was so tempted to come and sit down here. Simone, thanks for inviting me. It's all right. Welcome once again to our Christmas program. Now, whether you are here, there's quite a number of us here, or if you're joining us, joining us online, um, you know this, I don't have to remind you, but I'm going to do it anyway. You are part of the One Turner Church family, as are all of you here today. If you're here for the first time, welcome. If you have joined us previously, welcome back. We have a slight problem, <coughs> which is that. It is not COVID, because I have been tested. Um, need my essential here. Ever since I got bronchitis uh, many years ago, once a year I seem to get this chesty cough thing, and, and most of you, yeah, you remember that. Um, in fact, the funny thing is I didn't get any of it this year, or all of last year. The last time I had it was 2019. So maybe it's face masks and hand, hand sanitizers, or maybe it's just not seeing anyone. Maybe that's, you know, that's kept the germs at bay. But I am glad that we have reopened. It seems the germs are glad too. But what I will do is I might just keep a little bit of a distance away from you guys today. Is that all right? I mean, if you want my germs, I, I will happily share it. Um, but I, I might just keep to myself just a little bit. Before we get to our Christmas message for today, I want to thank Shani, uh, Shani, Shani, Shane and her team. We literally, unlike previous years, we literally had a quarter of the time, if not less, to put uh, this program together because we just, we just didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I know one particular church decided to go online, as we did last year, and they pre-recorded a huge chunk of it, and the next day, hey, everyone come back to church. So... So I don't know what they've decided to do, um, but I'm glad that we are here. So Shani and your team, great uh, job for organizing and putting everything together. Thank you, Brian, for the prayers. Uh, I am going to pray. It's some of you who are here watching for the first time. This is a quirky Yoshi thing, okay? Yeah, I just like to kneel because normally I found that when I pray at the start, I just kind of get a little bit more calm. Is that okay? I've, I've done this for 10 years, but I still get very excited and nervous and speak really, really fast. So I need to pray, and then we can slow down, and we can get going so you can understand what I'm trying to say. All right, let's pray. Feel free to stay seated. I'm going to kneel as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we enter into our Christmas message for today, Lord, I thank you that we can be here together. We can watch online. We can, even as we're traveling or, or away, um, but Lord, my prayer remains the same, that you would hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. May you just not open our uh, minds, but I open our hearts as well as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So because of my well-timed incessant cough, and the unlikelihood of me being able to talk extensively, I'm going to do sort of what I did last week. I'm going to be a little bit creative with my message today. I have enlisted my beautiful wife right there to help me do some of the reading uh, of the slides that we'll have on screen. And throughout our message today, I want to show you three short clips. It kind of bookends our message for today. Now, as you can see, the title of our Christmas message today is Missing the point. Missing the point. Uh, uh, this is how we're going to do our message. We're going to do it in two parts. We'll be spending most of our time in part one, so probably about 70%, talking about how easy to, it is to miss the point and what the point is. And then in part two, I'll play kind of like two short video clips to bookend that section as I talk about how to not miss the point. So part one, how easy it is to miss the point and what the point is. Part two, how to not miss the point. If you are confused and have already missed the point, that's okay. Don't worry. It'll all be relatively evident shortly. But let me start with this clip that sets the stage of where our presentation, our Christmas message will go today. Here we go.
Man, I wonder what it was like to really be to be born in a manger. <laughs> I know, right? I wonder what ever happened to baby Jesus. He grew up. Wait, you're telling me that the baby Jesus from the Christmas story is the same baby Jesus as the adult walk on water Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess I guess I never really put those two concepts together. Wow. Well, I wonder what ever happened to that guy. He went to the cross. That's the same guy? Yeah. Baby Jesus is the same as cross Jesus. Yeah, I, I mean, he grew up. I mean, there's some time in there, you know. He grew up, he, uh, he taught people, he lived a perfect life. He, uh, he died on the cross, he came back to life, you know. Now he lives in our hearts. That's the same guy? The Jesus that lives in our hearts. Yeah. <laughs> this is really, okay. I guess I just didn't put two and two together. This is, whew. Wow. Merry Christmas, Denver. I guess we should just try to view Christmas instead of one isolated event and more of an ongoing story about our salvation. Yeah, it's a, it's a great idea. Great idea. Now, of course, just in case you missed the point, um, the video basically had that guy for some reason thinking that baby Jesus, adult Jesus, cross Jesus, resurrected Jesus, Jesus in our heart Jesus, and what would Jesus do Jesus were for some reason different people. The video is, of course, an exaggeration. I mean, no one clearly thinks that, right? If there's anything, I mean, that's common sense, but if there's anything this last couple of years have taught us is that our common sense is not so common. In fact, let's rewind to 21 years ago. This article uh, is just a scan of a newspaper article, but apparently it's real. This is the headline. Church closes food bank because it attracts poor people. Now, I had to see if this was actually true, and apparently it is. Now, you probably can't quite read the article, so I'm going to get uh, Nadia to read it for me. A busy church food bank, known for offering warm drinks and snacks to its regulars, has announced its closing because it is attracting too many poor people. It's attracting a lot of street people that made it uncomfortable, said Charlotte Prosson, Un Unity Truth Centre Minister. It's creating social unrest in the church. A food bank is a social service, and that is not who we are. Ms. Prosson said the program is being canceled to focus on more church-specific activities. The church's board of trustees made the decision to cancel the bi-monthly food bank after receiving an email from a sister church in Victoria. Most clients of food banks have not yet come to a sense of personal responsibility in life. They are still in denial, blame, or seeing the world as owing them, wrote Reverend David Dirksen of the City Church in Victoria. Ms. Prosson praised the work done by food banks and said the church will still collect food for baskets, but focus more on people's spiritual hunger. Now, to be that, that reads like satire, right? So I actually had to make sure it's actually real, and apparently it is, though there was a follow-up news by NBC um, that, you know, the, the same minister is quoted as saying, oh, we, you know, there were other reasons, not just this. Um, things like oh and insurance and things like that. Though the article does not refute what was in this one that I've just shown you. So what has this got to do with, I guess, the Christmas message for today? You can probably kind of see where I'm going with this, how easy it is to miss the point. In fact, as much as I planned this for this to be a Christmas message, 
it, the point stands for not just the Christmas season, but the whole year in general. In fact, I can basically say it applies to Christians, to Christianity in general. And what do I mean? It's important to note this. Now, consider... Um, thank you, Brian. Just put it down. Now, consider uh, this... Everybody know who Gandhi is, right? Most of, most of us do. All of us should. If you've been following my sermons, I've been attending one channel for the last few years. A quote that I've repeated a few times in my messages is this one by Gandhi. Some of you could probably recite it, which is not necessarily a bad thing. This is what Gandhi says. He says, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So for some reason, Gandhi, who is not Christian, got his picture of Christianity from the Bible, and when he matches that up with who Jesus is and who uh, Christians that he's met are, it, it just doesn't miss up. It just doesn't, doesn't gel, and I guess you can say they miss the point. So here's the thing, though. The Christmas message is one of the easiest and one of the hardest messages to preach. It's easy to preach because the essence of the Christmas message is actually the Christian message. So some of you who are here for the first time is listening, well, what is the Christmas message? The Christmas message is essentially the Christian message. For the last couple of months here at One Turner, we have delved deep into the book of Revelation, but today's message is as simple as it gets. The reason why the Christmas message is hard to preach is not because it's the same message every year, it's the basics of Christianity. It's hard because it's so simple, you can easily miss the point. And hence the title of the message for today. How do you sum up the Christmas message? How do you sum up the Christian message? Two verses. In fact, you can probably do it in just one. And this is this one right here. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's literally the gospel right there. Now, you can probably add a number of verses to that, the Christmas story and all the things. Um, uh, two verses that I want to share. This, the other one is found in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. The Bible says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. So the story, I really wanted to play with the felt. It's the, it's the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that before you leave, Simone, today. The story that we've told, Jesus coming to this earth, born as a baby, um, he came to save us. That Really, it's, that's as basic, as simple as it gets. Uh, Jesus came to this earth to prepare us for a better world to come, to remind us that we do not belong here, that there is something better to come. It's so simple. And yet it's so easy to miss the point because we let other things draw our focus away. The last two years have changed our lives forever. Forever. It's taught us that nothing is certain. And the only consistency, as somebody said to me, is the only consistency is change. That we can expect things to change. In our Christmas message last year, which we all had to watch from home, I shared this from dictionary.com. I want to repeat that. Some of you will remember this. Dictionary.com in, in April of 2020. This April, shortly after the pandemic started. They asked this question. Words and phrases you never want to see or hear again once this is over. Like they were preparing for it to be over back in April of 2020, right? It's like, what are the words, okay? So... These were the top eight words. Words and phrases you never want to see or hear again. New normal. Social distancing. Speaking moistly. Now, I have to explain this one, if you forgot. <laughs> but Justin Trudeau, who was the Canadian Prime Minister, uh, was, saying, was encouraging everyone to wear masks. And he says that wearing masks can prevent, and I quote, people from breathing or speaking moistly. He immediately regretted the turn of phrase and said, what a terrible image. So I've never heard that again since, which is fine. Here's one that I have, haven't heard for a little while and I hope I never hear again. Toilet paper shortage. <laughs> 
We may be hungry, we may be tired, but at least we will be clean. <laughs> Essential, trying times, unprecedented, uncertain. Now, if you had asked this not in April of 2020, but maybe a few months down the track, the end of last year, one of the words that would have definitely made the list would be lockdown. Yes, nobody wants to hear that ever again, right? But here's the really interesting thing. So what is this going to do about anything? Just, just stay with me, OK? I'm going to take a slight detour. Um, I promise, stay with me, and you won't miss the point. Every year, dictionary.com has a word. Word of the year, they call it. So can you guess what their word of the year for 2020 was? No, it's not fire, Dan Andrew. Some of you would like that. What is their word of the year for 2020? Guess. What? I, yeah, nobody wants to guess? What is it? Vaccine. Vaccine? Vaccine? Yep. Nope. <laughs> COVID. COVID? COVID? Nope. Nope. Nobody's Googling? Good. What? Masks? Nope. It's, no, it's just one word. Word of the year for 2020. The word of the year for 2020 is, da -da -da, this is straight from the website in an article published on the 30th of November 2020. The word of the year is pandemic. pandemic. You're like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, the article is quite long. I want to read you a few excerpts from the article explaining why. <laughs> I'm going to get um, Nadia to read it. Pandemic, dictionary.com, word of the year 2020. Thanks, honey. At dictionary.com, the task of choosing a single word to sum up 2020, a year roiled by a public health crisis, an economic downturn, racial injustice, climate disaster, political division, and rampant disinformation, was a challenging and humbling one. But at the same time, our choice was overwhelmingly clear. From our perspective, as documenters of the English language, one word kept running through the profound and manifold ways our lives have been un upended and our language so rapidly transformed in this unprecedented year. That word is pandemic, our 2020 word of the year. At the start of 2020, it was unthinkable that parents would need to have a serious conversation about the word pandemic, a word which may have previously felt like a term from the history books to their children around the dinner table. It was unfathomable that by that year's end, the word pandemic would become part of our everyday speech to the point of over-familiarity, even fatigue. Okay, so if you read the article, it seems like everything, life, you know, I mean, it's hard to not talk about the pandemic, and that was basically the context of 2020. So, about 10 days ago, um, which now brings us to the word of the year for 2021. Ten days ago, what is it? Ten days ago? Yeah, something like that. December 6th of 2021. The 2021 word of the year was published. Anyone want to guess who it is? You will never guess. I can categorically say that you will never guess unless you have Googled it right now. That's cheating. What is the 2021 word of the year? What is it? It's not Donald Trump, honey. <laughs> what do you think? Freedom. Lockdown? Freedom? Nope, nope. You'll never guess. Vaccine? Nope. Nope. I didn't hear that, but nope. <laughs> Was it pandemic? Nope. Nope. What else? Conspiracy? Nope. Delta? Nope. Pfizer? Nope. <laughs> Brian? Laptop. Laptop. Stand. <laughs> You'll never guess. Book. Book. Nope. 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 Wrong. 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 The 2021 word of the year is. <laughs> now, if now if you're tempted like me and my wife to pronounce it as allyship, you are wrong. It's allyship. Okay. Let's read a couple of excerpts from this article. You're like, where is he going with this? I'm, I'm, just, I'm lost. Stay with me. Stay with me, okay? I promise we'll come back to the point. So stay with me. 
We're going to read the definition, or we're going to read what, just the three or four slides, what dictionary.com has to say about allyship. 20, 2021 was a year defined by many ongoing impacts of the pandemic and the polarization of 2020 and the various ways we continue to grapple with them. The vastness of such a year could never be fully summarized with a single word, but there is one word that's intertwined with so many of the things we've experienced in 2021, allyship, our 2021 word of the year. Yeah. No? All right, maybe we should need to, some of you are like, what does that even, what does that word even mean, okay? Uh, let me, let me, let, let's, let's have a look at the definition, okay? Uh, let's have a look at the definition of the word allyship. Allyship, the status or role of a person who advocates and actively works for the inclusion of a marginalised or politicised group in all areas of society, not as a member of that group, but in solidarity with its struggle and point of view and under its leadership. Okay, so the word allyship consists of the word ally, which means being allied with someone, and ship that creates that shipness. With, <laughs> in terms of an ally, <laughs> read the dictionary.com. I've got, I'm just gonna get Nadi to read the next three slides, which kind of sums it all up. It'll make sense, okay? So here, here, here we go, here we go. In 2021, allyship was increasingly discussed in relation to historically marginalized <coughs> groups, especially black and LGBTQ plus communities. There was also noticeable discussion of engaging in allyship for other specific groups, for parents balancing work and childcare during school shutdowns, especially mothers taking on the bulk of caregiving. There was allyship discussion for healthcare workers, teachers, flight attendants, and retail and service industry workers, for all of the people disproportionately burdened by a pandemic that has claimed over 5 million lives and counting, even as many of us try to get back to some kind of normal. And if you read the rest of it, the way the article reads is simply this. Dictionary.com is trying to come up with a word and they chose allyship because it is a call to support, to encourage, and to lift each other up. This is how the article finishes. Finally, allyship has the power to bring us all together. In trying and divided times, the word allyship sounds a much needed note of hope, optimism, and possibility for the future. Hopefully a future in which the word is not just given lip service, but lived out. Here's to hoping we can, we can all get allied around that. We live in a world where a 100% totally secular, non-Christian, non-religious organization sees that our world is broken. There are marginalized groups in all areas. There are people struggling, so they chose a word that is effectively a call to arms. Dictionary.com sees a better future is necessary if everyone does their part to practice allyship, to work together, to live together, to support, to encourage, and to love each other. Amid a fractured world, I never expected Dictionary.com to be the site that brings people together, or at least tries to. You know, there's a need to bring good to this world, to treat those lesser than us, more unfortunate than us in a better way, and there is always someone worse off than you in one way, shape, or form. You know, as I read through this entire article, and I stumbled across it by accident. I'm not checking dictionary.com every day, by the way. Actually, I am, just trying to figure out what words mean all the time. But um, I, I have to say that's commendable. I have to say that's commendable. But somebody ought to tell dictionary.com that 2,000 years ago, someone called Jesus came to earth to do just that. In the Bible, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, this is what Jesus said his purpose and mission was. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
I should write to dictionary.com and say that, oh, I'm not sure if you know this, but Jesus invented allyship. You are 2,000 years too late. But here's the question. How often do we, as Christians, as believers, miss the point? How do we make sure that during not just this Christmas season, but the rest of our lives, those of us that pro profess us to be a Christian, that we don't miss the point? And so now we come. Uh, there are many ways to answer this question, and we're keeping it short and simple. We're going to come to the second part, which is a shorter part, but I'm going to show you a, a clip that kind of illustrates my point. Um, I'll show you the clip, and then I'll elaborate a little. Just all credit to Marissa Webb. We'll link her channel in our YouTube description link. I just want to mention that the second half of the video, there is no sound, so don't worry. It's just um, text and video. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. She's doing something called a shell game, which is what she says at the start. So you guys need to pay attention, OK? Pay attention. Here we go. This is the show game. I'm going to hide this Hershey's Kiss under this cup, and the object is for you to pay attention and follow along and try to guess which cup the Hershey's Kiss is under at the end. Try to guess if it's in the left cup, the middle cup, or the right cup. Let's check the left cup. The middle cup? If you guess the middle cup, you got it right. So now we're going to make it a little more complicated. I've added an extra pair of hands, and I've added additional colors here. But that's only to distract you from the pink cups. The pink cups will always have, one of the pink cups will always have the Hershey Kiss underneath. So let's get started. So can you guess where the Hershey Kiss is? Show of hands, how many of you didn't see the duck? Okay. How many of you didn't see the fifth hand? Okay. How many of you didn't notice the cups changing color? Okay. How many of you didn't see the duck, didn't see the fifth hand, didn't see the changing color, and couldn't find the chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, always, there's always one, right? Um, how many of you knew what the experiment was going to be about? Because I've shown something similar but still miss the duck 
or the hand or the colors? Okay. Did anybody see all three and found the chocolate? No, but I found it. Oh, <laughs> good on you, Gosha. How many were confused and just totally missed the points? Like, what are you trying to say? The point is very simple. At the end of the day, it comes down to what you are keeping your eyes on. That's what will have your most attention. You know, when I showed this activity, this video in a different context, the point was that we can be so tunnel vision that we lose sight of the bigger picture, and that's true, and that's true. But the point that I want to make today is that what you focus on, what you choose to put your attention to, that will take most of your time. It will be what drives you, it will be how you live your life. If your goal is really just about finding the chocolate, does it really matter that much if you miss the other things? Does it really matter? You know, the next time you see a video like this again, chances are you'll be so busy looking at other things, you probably will miss the chocolate. My message for you today is actually very simple. Sometimes we're so concerned about figuring out everything when the simplest thing about Christmas is to focus on Jesus. The simplest thing about Christianity is to focus on Jesus. It is the only thing that matters. The only problem is when our focus, the one thing that we keep our eye on is not Jesus, when our one track mind is focused on something else. You know, I believe when we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, it doesn't mean that all our problems will go away, not even close. They will still be there. But with him by our side, it means that he will make those things easier for us to bear, to handle, and that is the point that Jesus came to this earth for us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by, so great, by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God." The point, my Christmas message today is very simple. As we spend time, as we celebrate Christmas with friends, with family, with gifts, with travel, and some of us are perhaps doing it on our own, regardless of where we're at, let's not miss the point of Christmas that Jesus is the greatest gift of all. And we need him more than ever, especially during these pandemic times. Jesus wants to be in allyship with us. And that's the point. I promise you, you will not regret it. It's the best gift of all, and I want to invite you and encourage you, wherever you are in your faith journey during this time and beyond, to discover him, to embrace him, especially as we learn of all that he has done for us. We'll finish our sermon with this clip. And then our worship team will come up and lead us in a song to close before I come up and close in prayer. <laughs>